Hey everyone, I'm Beth Potter along with Layla. I'm one of the co-organizers for Explorations in Archaeology and we are very excited to have David Pompiani with us today. David is a geochemist and sedimentologist who studies past environmental change caused by both natural climate variability and anthropogenic forces. He combines field and laboratory work to document past environmental change using lake sediment cores. He is currently an adjunct professor in the Department of Geology at Kansas State University. So welcome, David. Thank you for having me. And should we just go? You are, yeah, you are, okay. whenever you're ready. Sure. So thanks again for having me and um, for giving this talk. I'm really excited. Today I'm going to talk about some recent research I've done. Um, the title is The Environmental Impact of a Pre-Columbian City Based on Geochemical Insights from Lake Sediment Cores Recovered Near Cahokia. This was a major part of my dissertation research and I'm currently publishing still on this subject. This talk in particular is based on a recent paper that was published online in 2018. You can find it in uh, Quaternary Research. Uh, if you don't have academic access, you can go to my research gate and download this paper if you're curious about reading more details about the talk we're gonna have today. So, Cahokia was um, the largest Native American city north of Mexico. It was located near East St. Louis, but it was a sprawling site, miles long. Um, it was on the floodplain east of the Mississippi River, right by East St. Louis. It had a peak population of around 15 to 20,000 near the central precinct of Cahokia, which we're gonna talk about and I'll define, between 1100 and 1200 AD. So here's an artist's rendition on the left-hand side of Cahokia, and we're actually looking at Rattlesnake Mound, where about 140 people were interred. And this, uh, um, this kind of uh, ridge top mound is what I think it would be referred to as. This is known as, um, sorry, my, okay, there we go. We're looking north along Rattlesnake Causeway at Cahokia towards Monk's Mound, which is the central precinct today. And I just want to show you this just to demonstrate to you that this site was landscaped and there were hundreds of mounds constructed over the site. So it was, it was a heavily modified landscape by prehistoric standards, I would say, in America. This is Monk's Mount, okay, at the very end. Cahokia was the largest of the Mississippian sites, urban and bigger settlements. It was here located in East St. Louis, but it was just one of a network of Mississippian and related cultural settlements like mound sites that stretched across the Midwest and Southeast United States. Cahokia was the earliest, probably among the Mississippian cultural sites. It certainly was the largest. Um, uh, but yeah, so I just wanted to give you a little context to show you it, this culture spreads out across the landscape in North America, especially in the Eastern and Southeast US. So today, Monk's Mound marks the central precinct of Cahokia. This is kind of the urban center, what you'd call the downtown maybe. Um, Monk's Mound is 30 meters high. It's com composed entirely of soil. It's 291 meters long. It is the largest prehistoric earthwork, so not made of stone, in the Americas, uh, especially by volume. The base is roughly the same area as the base of the Great Pyramid of Giza. So it's huge and it's made of dirt that was moved by people only because there were no beasts of burden during the Mississippian period, you know, the horses or oxen or anything like that. Um, 
And you have to remember, we're looking at Monk's Mound. This was the central, this is like the large, it's the biggest mound that exists today. But the Cahokia is huge. It's, it goes kilometers, miles, both east, uh, or sorry, west and north of the site. So when we're talking about Cahokia, like as a general sense, we're not like specifically re talking about Monk's Mound. This is referred to as greater Cahokia. So it's like the, the urban with the suburban all together, like LA metro area, but not, we're not talking about Los Angeles downtown. So that's important to understanding the Lake Center record because it's kind of north of the central precinct. Sometimes. What's that? Oh, sorry, Katie's calling. She's in the other room listening to this. Okay, so the central precinct is demarcated by this palisade wall that was built around it. It was a wood and mud palisade wall. It was rebuilt maybe up to four times during about a century um, during the occupation of Cahokia. And if we were to build one of these from scratch and around the central precinct, it would take about 15 to 20,000 oak and hickory logs, about six meters long to produce one full palisade wall around the, the central precinct. This just kind of gives you insight into the scale to which the environment could be being modified around the area. Um, and this is just wood to build a palisade wall, not wood to cook, not wood to build houses, canoes, or anything like that. Um, so just to give you an idea, just a little bit of a scale uh, for Cahokia. Um, the artifacts suggest that there are several distinct phases over the growth and, of, and decline of Cahokia. Um, Cahokia itself emerged, which they, those people wouldn't have referred to themselves as Cahokians or Mississippians. These are names that we have given them based on the artifact record and the, and the bone record that they left behind. So the Cahokia, it emerged from late woodland cultures that were living along the Mississippi River between the confluence of the Missouri and Ohio River. This is referred to as the American bottom today. We, today we refer to this culture, not just Cahokia, but the culture that kind of spread out across these river valleys as the Mississippians. The earliest phase of Cahokia, Mississippian Cahokia is referred to as the Loman phase. And this is dated to between 1050 and 1100 AD. In this area around Monk's Mound, there was this sudden resettlement of the site that was different from woodland. And then there was this movement of people centralizing around the central precinct. And there was a sudden surge in population. Um, there's been interesting research put out using strontium isotopes recently to show that these pe people came from all around to move to Cahokia. And then there was this initiation of the mound construction, building earthworks around the site which continued into the Sterling phase, which is considered like the golden era, the, the apex of Cahokia, especially near the central precinct. There's peak populations at that time. They start building palisade walls near the end of the Sterling phase. Um, and there was a continuation of mound building. During the Moorhead phase, there seems to be a population decentralization around the central precinct. So population densities decline, but it's still being occupied and used as a site more for just civic and ceremonial purposes. Um, there's a decline in the construction of mounds. And, and finally, the sand prairie phase between 13 and 1400 AD, there was the gradual Mississippian abandonment of the site. And afterwards, it was probably occupied intermittently or at low scales up until the um, 
the rival of your your European settlement and Euro-American settlement in the area. So we have those broken down into different times, but there's still tons of questions. There are many mysteries surrounding the growth and decline of this, like, this ancient city near East, East St. Louis. Like, what was the environmental impact of Cahokia? I mean, it must have left a, a large impact considering the extensive remains found at the site. So that was the primary interest. That was the question driving my dissertation was, can I measure the environmental impact of ancient sites or like Cahokia using sediment cores from nearby lakes? Because I realized that if we can measure human activity through time, like detailed high resolution, we can compare that to artifact data like radiocarbon dates from artifacts, paleoclimate records, and lake sediment records of human activities at other sites in, in precise manner that we couldn't do before. And so that's what I hope to show you today with this talk, what we can do. So here's Monk's Mound. And just north of the site is this beautiful Oxbow Lake known as Horseshoe Lake. It is an ideal site to study human environmental interaction at Cahokia using lake sediments. It's um, about three kilometers north of Monk's Mound. So it's, it's in the northern suburbs of the central precinct, but there, is a, there are a few higher density or higher population density sites in the watershed. They're smaller than the central precinct, but like Mitchell site, Horseshoe Lake Mound site and then a few other ones are located just along the shoreline and north of the shoreline of the lake. So if we're looking over here, that's actually Horseshoe Lake Mound, you can see in this cartoon, and Mitchell site would have been over here. So basically the point is Horseshoe Lake would have been measuring the northern suburbs pollution. It, it's not recording, the, I don't think, the full urbanization at the central precinct because the central precinct is actually just outside of the watershed. So to study human environmental interaction with lake sediments, first we need a, a sediment core. And for those who are not familiar with this kind of research, we go out to the lake with boats. We use something called a Livingston core, which is a metal tube barrel to extract sediment from the bottom of the lake in these tubes. And we keep taking sections overlapping till we get as deep as we can get. And, and they're stored in a lab where we then split them in half and sample them. We can sample them through time because we develop something called an age model. So what is an age model? On the right hand side, we're looking at, at the actual picture of the core from Horseshoe Lake. This is the depth in centimeter here. The where we've photoshopped out all the overlapping areas. So we're just kind of looking at the core kind of compressed into this shape so we can see it really easily. It's a long, it's three and a half or almost three and a half meters long. What we do is we take samples from the layers and we do something called radiometric dating. One common method you're probably familiar with is radiocarbon dating, but there's other ones like lead 210. We take those dates so here are radiocarbon dates down the core. And then on the top of the core, I dated with this thing called lead 210. We had to extrude this sediment, which you'll see pictures of later, which means we had to actually scrape it off in the field because it was too flocculent, too muddy to actually be preserved in the core tube. Lower down in the sediment cores, the sediments are more dense, so they stay preserved. So this part we have to remove. We dated it. Um, all the way down to about 400 AD, you know, uh, the last date something like between around 500 AD. I don't remember exactly what the date was. Um, this is simply just the mathematical relationship between the sediment depth and the age. So when we take a sample at any depth, we can easily calculate the age of that sample along with 95% confidence for that age estimate. 
So it's really important these things, these age models, because they set the stage for everything else. And I would say, in my opinion, from looking at a lot of age models, this is a fairly strong age model. So Horseshoe Lake is, here's a map of it. Uh, this is a central precinct at Monk's Mound. Here's the core location. And here are the other sites around the lake. The Mitchell site is just north of the map here. So there's been previous research at Horseshoe Lake. Ohlendorf in 1993 wrote her dissertation on the site. This revealed that there was a, a really deep, long sediment record preserved in, in an oxbow lake along the Mississippi River, which is a big finding at the time. And that you could find maize pollen way down deep in the layers of the core, suggesting that it had prehistoric maize pollen in it. Um, but the problem is there was no radiometric dating. There was no age model developed. So she could only speculate on the ages of the sediment. Could it be 200 years old or 2000? There was no way of knowing without radiometric dating, for sure. Other people, Brugam and Vermilion in the early 2000s, cored the lake and they analyzed geochemical proxies like isotopes and metals. They only examined the last 500 years, but they determined that the, the recent sediment core record records human impact on the landscape remarkably well. So I saw these studies and I was like, wow, if, it, if this lake is that sensitive to modern change, then it's got to record something during Cahokia. Other researchers, Munoz and White et al., they expanded the age model past 500 years to like around 500 AD. And they examined other proxies like pollen, charcoal, leaf wax, and, and fecal scannels. They have done a lot to expand the research, but the problem with many of their records is that they have low sampling resolution that doesn't really extend that far be up before Cahokia or after, or it is only sampled very, very coarsely. So you don't really get a true trend in a paleoclimate proxy. And they also have a questionable age model, which I will detail in a minute um, later on in this talk, which I think because White builds off of Munoz's age model, it kind of contaminates both of these studies with this questionable age model. So again, I'll talk about that in a minute. So it brings me to my research, the environmental impact of the pre-Columbian city based on geochemical insights. So I think that's really where my work builds on further. So I recovered cores in 2012 and 2013 from Horseshoe Lake. And I dated these cores like I showed in the age model with 14 led to 10 ages and eight radiocarbon dates. So this is us getting the core. This is a surface core, polycarbonate tube core. You can see here's, uh, this is approximately two and a half to three meter long core with some of the equipment we use to extract these cores from shallow water. Um, and we just use these simple blow up boats with a raft uh, or a wooden frame that we can easily obtain the cores um, by hand pretty much. This is us taking off the top of the core so we can extrude this sediment. This is the stuff that we remove in layer by layer, centimeter by centimeter layer till it gets dense sediment that stays preserved and intact in the core. And there's, this is actually Katie Pompiani doing that right now. Um, so we measured a lot of proxies in this in these cores. These are all the proxies. We're not going to have to get into each one in detail, but for those that are interested, we did magnetic susceptibility, which tells us the kind of mineral matter changes in the lake, loss on ignition, which is organic matter. We looked at uh, fossil maize pollen, the presence of it, fossil charcoal. We looked at heavy metals like lead, copper, potassium, and aluminum and the isotopes of carbon and nitrogen in organic matter, 
and the isotopes of carbon in carbonate minerals deposited in the sediment. So it's slightly different. Well, it's a whole different proxy actually. So <clears throat> this is the, the first result figure from the lake. These we're looking just so everyone's oriented on the x-axis. This is year AD, two, year 2000, year 400 AD or common era. Some people refer to it as. Um, we're looking so we're looking at variations here in carbon isotopes through time, going back in time. This is charcoal. I have them labeled here. When we don't have to look at each wiggle too much in detail, but I want you to notice several patterns that are delineated by this gray bar in the middle. So on this left-hand side, you kind of see this higher C to N trend, this higher magnetic acceptability trend, higher charcoal, and these kind of just stay flat. My interpretation is that this side is representing more flood material because these proxies here are sensitive to terrestrial mineral matter and organic matter. And so being higher suggests more of that is being de delivered to the lake. Then we have the gray bar where everything is kind of flat. Uh, there's not much going on, no distinct spike or any change. This gray bar actually represents the Sterling phase. Around the Sterling phase, the, the apex of Cahokia. This is when it happened. Um, on the other side, the proxies pretty much stay flat. There's a little bit of an increase in C to N here in the early or late 1800s. That's probably associated with deforesting the catchment mechanically for agriculture and delivery of terrestrial organic matter to the lake. A little bit higher charcoal. Magnetic stability does record a big shift. And um, again, I think that's from large scale deforestation around the lake. But I call this, I interpret these as mostly driven by natural variability. This is, these proxy I think are, are control proxies is how I interpreted them in the paper because they don't appear to be sensitive or being driven primarily by human activities. They seem to be driven mostly by natural variability, natural development of the watershed. Why do I say that? Well, if we look at proxies that we know are linked directly to human activity, there is a, a big change during the occupation of Cahokia that's not evident in these proxies. And mind you, these are the proxies used by most people studying lake sediments, for, studying human environmental impact in lake sediments. So I think there's a very, we need to expand our, our proxies to see the big, the fuller picture here. So if I just take that exact gray bar and we just move it to a new graph with proxies that we know are sensitive to human activity, notice Cahokia is the occupation of Cahokia in the Sterling and um, Bowman and uh, Moorhead phases, you can see a clear shift in the sediment. That's not measured during the woodland period. And so to me, this suggests that these ones are sensitive. These are what I interpret as anthropogenic proxies. First, we can see that they record the modern historic changes fairly accurately. There is a lead smelter built around the lake. And as soon as the lead smelter closed and they removed leaded gasoline from, from the fuel, if we zoomed in here, you could see there's a clear decline tracking that reduction in lead to the lake. It also follows it historically perfectly well. So, and we see that also with nitrogen, which is very sensitive to sewage and other reactive nitrogen compounds that contaminate groundwater. So underlying Horseshoe Lake is a sand aquifer. So it's a, fl a flat floodplain. If you start to put waste in, in the ground, burrow pits or in cesspools, it quickly contaminates the aquifer that delivers water to Horseshoe Lake. So understanding the oxbow hydro, hydrogeology makes it's really important when you're interpreting these records. So we see an increase in nitrogen isotopes in the modern period suggesting contamination with human sewage and maybe livestock sewage, which is what we see around the lake. 
It's actually highly correlated with the census populations in the townships around the lake. We see this little bump, although it's small during the period of Cahokia, that is significant. So it is above natural variability. And we see a change in drastic change in carbon isotopes found in carbonate minerals. This suggests the source, the uh, change in the dissolved organic carbon source delivered to the lake. This can be caused by disturbing soil. So we had mounds made of soil around the lake. We have agriculture along the lake. I wouldn't be surprised that it's changing, it would change the sources of dissolved or inorganic carbon to groundwater. Then we see these increases in the, the metals, lead and copper, are heavy metals that are linked to human pollution. These all increase at the same time. So I think what we're seeing here is this response. This is the geochemical record of the impact of Cahokia. And what we can do with this is very interesting. And as we go at the, the end of the talk, we're gonna talk about what is the implications that we can measure output, heavy metal output, nitrogen waste from prehistoric cities in, in the United States. I mean, it, it's, I think has huge implications. So just to show you what I mean by natural variability versus anthropogenic. This is, I think, a very important concept. It's a very new one in paleolimnology. So here is um, natural, here's anthropogenic. This is from the same exact core. It's not a different core or just looking at different proxies. See how much different it can be if you only focus on proxies that are sensitive to human activity. With these ones, there's a number of natural processes that can affect charcoal, for example which is a very, very, very common proxy for human activity. But we forget how much charcoal can be produced naturally. It's very common naturally, extremely common if you go in the Rocky Mountains. How much is human, how much is related to, to natural variability is very hard to disentangle. So with these ones we know, like lead, for example, if there wasn't a human that lived around this lake, it would have been as flat as between one and three part per million for that whole record. You have to zoom in to see the, the natural variability in lead. It does move a little bit, but it's tiny compared to what humans can do to heavy metals. So that's what makes heavy metals so much better as proxies for human activity. So if we take two proxies from the lake, nitrogen isotopes, carbon isotopes that we know are sensitive to human activity and we do a scatter plot, what emerges are two distinct anthropogenic clusters. So we see the modern in the blue where we have this rise in nitrogen and we have this shoot, this like, you know, excursion during Cahokia. Um, we also see groupings move up this way and the nitrogen versus a natural proxy to C to N. So what this reveals is that that modern and Cahokia, the impact they had on the lake falls outside of the range of natural variability. Because we have to parameterize, parameterize what is the natural variance in geochemistry. There's El Nino's happening. There's um, changes maybe in animal migrations and uh, droughts and weather, tornadoes. All these can affect sediment changes. We have to be able to account for that and then see where does where do these proxies do get out of outside of that? How do they? And I think that's a very strong indicator that we're actually looking at human impact. So I want to examine some of the previous research from Horseshoe Lake. Uh, it's been all over the news. And I think I just want to touch base on that a little bit. This is uh, uh, the flood hypothesis that has been put forth by Nunos et al. and colleagues uh, in papers the first papers were in 2014 and 2015. They have a different, uh, these are the actual papers, a record of sustained prehistoric and historic land use in geology and a paper in proceedings in National Academy of Sciences. I wanna examine the evidence in these papers with all of you so you can kind of decide what you think. 
these um, have spawned quite a lot of news articles. Um, and so I just, and you may have run across these. I see them, you know, in popular news sites all the time. So let's look at the actual evidence from these studies. This is the MUNOS 2014 paper, the sustained land use paper from um, in geology. The evidence in that paper boils down to there is a shift in pollen around here that uh, around 400 AD with this decline in floodplain or boreal pollen um, like willow, uh, which is a pretty small change, I would say. And the rise in grass pollen and other cultigens like ragweed. And so this here is the rise in land use, the sustained rise till you have Cahokia and the Sterling phase that happens between 1100 and 1200. That's the, the peak population around Cahokia. But there's some other things that kind of confuse me when I look at this. There's, if ragweed's sensitive to this deforestation, there's a rise after the, the thing is abandoned. There's, um, hardly any change in oak and hickory, even though we know they were used to build the palisade wall and there must have been tens of thousands of removed. Maybe there is a reason they preserved oak around the site. Um, maybe it, some of these pollen come in from long distances. Other ones are sensitive to really only close by the lake. There's also a, a slight, there's some maize detected in the sediments. Um, but there's other things like this in the modern, the, the grass declines, even though there's an expansion of settlement and grass along the lake, we do see an increase in ragweed. My feeling from interpreting this and a lot of other pollen records they use to in, examine human environmental interactions is that we can't determine what is driven naturally and what is being driven by humans. We know during this time was the medieval climate anomaly, the little ice age there were changes in climate that are changed pollen distributions. So for me, disentangling the human signal from this, I think is very difficult. And I don't think it's the best way to look at the past or to determine these relationships that we wanna see. There's better proxies. Um, the big thing though, from this paper, this is all totally feasible, that the sustained land use from this grass pollen curve goes all the way back to 500 AD, even though there's no evidence for maize that early on, at least in the archeological record, and that it declined right after the, the Sterling phase, totally feasible. The one thing that's missing though, is the entire disturbance layer found in the geochemistry, a 20 centimeter thick layer was deleted from, is omitted from this graph. And that's right here at the Mississippi flood. So in reality, there is a 20 centimeter gap right in here during the occupation of Cahokia because of the lack of pollen preserved in that sediment layer and other evidence. So this was interpreted as a mega flood or a large flood that occurred near the apex of Cahokia and potentially affected its cultural trajectory. So we, if we, the, the layer was actually published later on in 2015 in the PNAS paper. And this is it right here, this distinctly gray sediment layer dated to the apex of Cahokia in this paper. Um, they use the grain size here, these increases with the Roman numeral numbers as flood events. And they, this gray layer is determined to be a flood event, a mega flood event. So let's examine this evidence a little bit closer. Let's look at the median grain size curve and compare it. So this is just grain size, one proxy, compare it with the geochemistry to see if there's any relationship between grain size and our uh, anthropogenic proxies. So there's the mega flood, one of them. So one of the lines of evidence for this flood event is in the radiocarbon age model from Munos et al. 2014, they, determined that these two radiocarbon dates, because this one's a little bit um, uh, younger and this is a little bit older, that this must have been an instantaneous event, a rapid sedimentation event. That's why it's given as a vertical line. It happened at a single moment. 
geologically speaking. And so this is a line of code put into the age model software. It's not necessarily been interpreted in there. And it's strange because this one wasn't interpreted that way, even though it looks the same. But um, this is one piece of evidence that perhaps this was a rapid sedimentation event. So that happened at 200 centimeters in this core. So we have a separate core from the same basin where we took and we had tested that hypothesis using radiocarbon dating. So in my core here, you can see the image. There's the gray layer. It's a slightly different color. Here's 200 centimeters. Radiocarbon dates above and below suggest the linear sedimentation rate for that layer. Um, and we have four dates as opposed to two. And our, it appears as though our error bars are also smaller because I've dated large charcoal. So to me, this suggests that the second piece of evidence, the grain size was one for mega flood. The lack of pollen was just omitted. And this rapid sedimentation, it doesn't seem to be holding up. So let's look closer at the grain size here. We're just simply going to turn this thing on its side, flip it over here. We have it plotted right here. The flood events are highlighted in gray on mine. The past is 400 to the present. And we're going to look at that and compare it to the geochemistry. To me, this suggests that grain size is not driving the geochemical change that we find during human the occupation of the watershed along the lake that we document both in the archeological record and during modern population growth. Specifically, so we see here's an increase of finding of grain size, um, but we, there's other events that don't seem to correspond with higher metals. And you can just kind of see that this, the shape of this curve looks nothing like this. So the changes in the grain size caused by flooding doesn't appear to be driving changes in the geochemistry. They seem to be more consistent with the hypothesis that they're being driven by human activity. So these news articles that have been coming out, I would put those in a category of, I'll think about it more and wait till more evidence. Um, I think the evidence is weak for the flood hypothesis um, and the collapse of Cahokia. Um, in addition to my research, there's no support for it in the archeological record, which almost alone really undermines the interpretation because Cahokia is one of the most extensively excavated sites in the United States, including burrow pits, which would essentially be basins on the site that would have recorded the, the flood, especially during the period when they were being occupied. So I think we should also defer to Occam's razor. The, a distinct layer geochemically found at the apex of Cahokia is likely caused by human activity, not some flood that has not been found in the archeological record and doesn't seem to be sort of supported geochemically or during using radiocarbon. So anyway, what I think we can conclude is the sediment deposits in Horseshoe Lake contain a detailed record of human disturbance to the surrounding catchment associated with the growth and decline of greater Cahokia, because Horseshoe Lake is north of, of the central precinct. Prehistoric human impacts are detectable in the geochemical proxy records over an approximately 70 year period from 1150 to 1220 AD with some error. The timing of these changes correspond with the population growth during the Sterling and Moorhead phases, the phases that the archeological record suggests are the apex of the site. And it seems to be totally consistent with their, the archeological interpretation. So what are the implications of this? Like we see this graph of lead or copper. I mean, what can we really do now that we can detect pollution from ancient societies? Well, we can go look at other sites and see if we can replicate that work and see and, and compare it to our records at Cahokia to see how do they jive in, in time and magnitude? Um, do they follow the archeological record uh, or do they help enhance it? So just recently in the last year, my friend and colleague published a lake sediment core record of lead 
and nitrogen isotopes from Kincaid, the third largest Mississippian site in the US. This is a paper that came out in 2019, the pre-Columbian lead pollution in Native American galena processing and land use in the mid-continent of the United States. Um, Broxton made a huge contribution here because he used isotopes to help source the, 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 the lead that was delivered to the lake. At Horseshoe Lake, we weren't really sure where these things were coming from. Um, we know there was a little bit of metal working around Monk's Mound. There was some use of galena. Um, there's copper workshop found. They had fires just for domestic purposes. But the exact source we weren't sure of. In this paper, Broxenberg uses isotopes to show that it's consistent with galena metalworking near the site, which they use ceremonially. This is a map of the site. There's a third biggest site. It's a few miles across. It's huge. And it's in the Black Bottom region of Illinois, right along the Ohio River. They took cores from right along the site. This is the Palisade Wall around the lake and the site. So when this was published, I was invited to write a research focus article by geology to detail the implications of these findings. And this paper I wrote, lead pollution can be detected in North America for thousands of years. I show that this technique is reproducible at multiple sites and that they're showing us the timing of metalworking at different eras in prehistory of North America. We are now doing it at Mississippian sites, but earlier in my dissertation, I looked at using lake sediment records near copper mines in Michigan and found that they also record lead and other copper increases during periods um, where archaic copper mining was occurring around Lake Superior. So that's middle to early Holocene hunter gatherers that created a metalworking industry that we can detect with lake sediments and we can detect it shifting across Lake Superior using this. So with Horseshoe Lake, let's do this. This is the first paper that compares to Mississippian era. So a thousand years ago, approximately sites. These are agriculturalists that made cities. Horseshoe Lake, we're just looking at lead and nitrogen from Horseshoe Lake. We're zoomed in on just the period, the prehistoric period here. We admitted the modern. And let's compare it with independently generated in a whole new lab results from another lake by a Mississippian site. So that's Avery Lake above it. And we're looking at the same exact proxies, lead and nitrogen. Totally different Mississippian settlement. Again, we see an increase during the period where the archaeologists say populations were max around the watershed of Avery. So this is showing that these proxies, to me, are, in, are definitely recording human activity. They're in totally different watersheds. This is the Ohio River watershed. This is the uh, Mississippi and Missouri watershed above the Ohio, uh, the confluence of the Ohio River. So if there was some kind of flood in the Missouri and Mississippi, it, it would never, it wouldn't have affected the Ohio River watershed because it's a draining Eastern North America. So just to have a, a let's say maybe a mega flood at two separate gigantic watersheds at the same time would be out of this world. And the fact that they coincide perfectly with the archeological record is strong evidence that lead pollution can be detected in North America for thousands of years. So we can, we can use it to map societies. So we, simply put lake sediment geochemistry can be used to map prehistoric economies in North America. So this will be the first insights into the timing, duration, geographic pattern, and magnitude of anthropogenic impacts in the pre-European period. It's just, it's a new window into, the, into which the study passed social change that was formally relegated entirely to artifacts and bones. This is a new way to look at social change. Uh, and it's being used at other places in the world. It's been being used uh, in the Andes and across Europe, Europe um, during the imperial um, 
in Asia, across Asia. So, but this is a brand new window for North America and particularly the United States. And so having these time series will facilitate precise comparisons with paleoclimate records. We'll now be able to compare changes in human activity with time series of paleoclimate records a lot easier. So I didn't tell everyone this earlier. I kept this a little secret. This is my secret. We also measured oxygen isotopes at Horseshoe Lake from autogenic carbonate minerals. That is a way, those are minerals that form in the water column during the summer. Um, calcite minerals, if you've taken intro to geology, you've seen them. Um, they are very, very fine. They settle at the bottom of the lake. When those minerals form, they capture the oxygen isotopic composition of the lake water. And we've been observing Horseshoe Lake and it, its oxygen isotope content is very sensitive to changes in the balance between precipitation to evaporation. So simply put, oxygen isotopes are a measure of hydroclimate or drought. So this gets interesting because now we have a proxy that shouldn't be sensitive to human activity, but should be highly sensitive to dr droughts. And now we have two sets of proxies to look at. And these are from the same exact core. So there's a very extremely precise comparison. I have the results under review at, in scientific reports right now where I compare the oxygen isotope record of Horseshoe Lake with the human sensitive proxies. So I, fingers crossed, it should be coming out soon. So keep an eye out and uh, you might be able to get, might be able to read it if the reviews go well. So I wanna give you a sneak peek. So you've, you've stuck with me this whole time. And let me give you my spiel. So I, I wanna give you a little sneak peek into this big, big find, I think. Here we have the, the land use proxies like we've been looking at, same exact ones. And now we're gonna compare them from the top, oh, geez, with the oxygen isotopes. So here again, we have the rise in land use change or anthropogenic land use intensity during the Stirling phase. These are the oxygen isotopes from Horseshoe Lake normalized for variability in source. Lower values are wetter, higher values are drier. So what we see is this run up to Cahokia and expansion of Cahokia happened during fairly wet conditions. Now the beginning of decentralization, remember in the Moorhead, when people's population decentralized, this begins a trend to drier conditions. And we see decreases in human activity consistent with people leaving. And then we see this abandonment happened during the largest drought in the last 1600 years. And it occurred over a 50 year period of exceptional dryness. If we compare to a regional record in uh, Indiana, Martin Lake, this is a proxy for summer precipitation. It's also consistent with a decline or a drought. And this new paper uh, by Cruss, they use statistical analysis to look at the radiocarbon dates from the Palisade Walls because they have lots of dates now. And they're able to make um, distribution probability that just density distributions of the beginning time about the best estimate they can come up with with an error bar along with the end of the palisade wall building period and this kind of shifts the dates a little bit but it's even more under this revised method is even more consistent with the geochemistry and the archaeological record because this final drought was the last time they built a palisade wall around the lake and after that populations were very low. Does this evidence suggest that drought perhaps had a big influence in the collapse and decline of Cahokia? My opinion would be that it's pretty strong evidence. So keep an eye out for that paper and hopefully the reviewers feel the same way and, uh, and uh, that's coming up in the future. So just wanna leave it at that. Uh, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Um, I'll take questions. Here's our field team. These are the people that actually did the research out in the field and helped me in the lab. 
Um, Matt Finkebeiner, who's at Wilkes in Pennsylvania. Aubrey's at Albany State. Uh, Chris ended up being a geophysicist um, for an oil company. Katie is becoming a forensic anthropologist for the DOD, and I'm at Kansas State um, right now. So that was the crew. So uh, any questions or anything? Thank you so much. Um, that was really interesting. Just everybody, please. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat already. So if you have questions, please just submit them there so that we can start working through the ones that have already been submitted. So the first question that we got was, Going back to your first figure with the anthropogenic uh, proxies, mm -hmm. what's your explanation or thoughts about the lack of maize pollen oh. during that time of interest? What a great thank, thank you to the person that gave that question because that's a very good point. Um, maize pollen is a very large pollen. It doesn't travel very far from the plant. Previous research um, by uh, Chad Lane, he looked at lakes that were surrounded by cornfields today and looked at the modern sediment. And, and many of the samples, even from the very top of the, the core, where we know corn's growing around there today, there was no maize pollen. Some of them are on the shoreline, there was. But basically what it showed was that maize is not really, the pollen in sediment is not a very good indicator of the presence or absence of, sorry, the absence of maize agriculture. If the pollen is there, we know the, the maize is there, but if there's no pollen there, we can't be sure that there wasn't maize. Um, so what that shows is that there was maize growing at that area for a lot. Our pollen work suggests in 600 AD, but the, the oldest radiocarbon dated corn cob is much later. I think, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's around 1000 AD. Our pollen suggests the corn got there a little bit earlier. Um, there is an evidence radiocarbon for it being there in like big quantities, but it's seen that during Cahokia, maize took off. Um, but we don't find any in the disturbance layer indicated by the geochemistry. So my, my feeling is, is because it's just not, its absence doesn't necessarily indicate that it wasn't going on and based on modern studies. So thank you for that question. Oh, thank you. Uh, the next question is related to the signature of stone tool production mm -hmm. and whether anybody's looked at silica signatures as a proxy for stone tool production. Nobody's done that. Um, yeah, that would be hard to, oh, excuse me, it would be hard to detect something like that because of the sediments are so many silicates in there. Um, one thing I've wondered though, um, outside of lithic production is what kind of impact does making ceramic pots have? Um, again, it's like if you're burning soil, like essentially that's what you're doing is cooking dried clay. Would it release a lot of something that we can detect? I don't know. Um, right, right now we're measuring isotopes from Horseshoe Lake so we can fingerprint these sources but the metals were not exactly sure where they are derived because of multiple types of metals being worked, the size of the site, um, the ceramic question. Um, but hopefully with isotopes, we'll be able to get in there in more detail and actually get answers to those questions. But for the short answer is, I don't, I don't think we could use that for lithics or, and it's questionable even for ceramic production in the core. Okay, yeah, thank you. So another question we have was, what's going on around the 250 centimeter depth? You seem to have a date that falls well older than your models, uh, directly followed by one that looks significantly younger mm -hmm. than your model trend. Is there any said strat justification for that? Nope, it, it's a just homogenous clay core all the way to the base, I mean, uh, more or less. Um, I, that, my feeling with that date is there's some contamination because it's way older than it should be. And it, and it falls out kind of of the, the trend of all the other dates. And so, um, and it was fairly small, which can affect sometimes the output of the date. 
So we just justified that as being contaminated and being very small and out of the alignment with the other dates in which we had seven other dates. And so we just omitted that from the age model as an outlier. And that can happen. Um, it's, uh, you hope it's minimal, but in the Lake Lake Horseshoe, it's more common. I was surprised at how clean our age model was, like how straight of a line it was, even though it was kind of wobbly, because there's hard water in the lake and, and hard water is full of a lot of dead inorganic carbon from limestone, which can affect radiocarbon dates. So you have to be very, very careful. I think that was one problem with Munos et al. from 2014, is they dated plant matter from the lake. And they're pulling carbons from perhaps the hard water in the lake, not from the atmosphere, or they're at least being contaminated by it. I was careful to choose only charcoal that was greater than 125 micrometers. So big for fossil charcoal. And I treated this to remove the carbonates very carefully. And charcoal's ideal over plant matter because we know charcoal, if it burned, it didn't burn underwater. Plants can grow, certain types of plants can grow underwater and other things that look like that. Um, and so we know it was exchanging carbon only with the atmosphere before it was burned. That's very vital for radiocarbon dating. And then when it's burned, the fire creates an, an updraft, low pressure, and that carries the smoke and everything up and that transfers that charcoal into the lake. And so we know that it probably represents around the same time it was produced. So the, yeah, so I guess that's a little extra, but we ended up throwing that date out basically. It wasn't because of stratigraphy. It wasn't like there was a uh, unconformity or a sand layer or anything like that, no. Okay, cool. So uh, somebody also wants to know if you tested lake water evaporation and did you use aquatic cellulose for your O18? And if not, what did you use? Okay, <clears throat> another great question. I'm, these are awesome. Um, we went out and measured water. We actually grabbed water samples. We were there in March of 2012. And talk about the best coincidence of my life. Later that summer ends up being the worst drought in like 50 years. If you remember the drought of 2012, it was huge. Um, so I had samples before of water isotopes, the oxygen isotopes before the drought started in, in the spring of, of 2012. And I had an undergrad researcher work with me whose family was in St. Louis and he was going there in the late summer during the peak of the drought. He went there and sampled the lake for me during the drought around the lake and other wetlands and creeks. And what it showed was the oxygen isotopes enriched because of evaporation along this thing called the local evaporation line, which is um, detailed in the scientific reports paper coming out. So it showed that in fact, the isotopes were tracking the drought. Um, and then we sampled more and control sites around the area and showed that in fact, yes, the oxygen isotopes directly measured from the water are sensitive to drought. The proxy we use in the core though, is not cellulose, it's uh, the autogenic calcite minerals. Those minerals, the carbonate minerals that form in the water column during the spring and summer, that's what we isolated from the sediment because we can, when you, react those with acid, it gives off CO2, which we run through a spectrometer to get the oxygen isotope composition of the carbonate mineral. So I think we like using carbonate minerals because once they form, um, they trap that, the isotopic ratio of the water in that lattice and they fall to the bottom of the lake and they accumulate like layers. And they're trapped, as, as long as that mineral is intact, we know the signals, uh, in the, in the actual mineral lattice. So that's why we use the calcite, but it's interesting seeing the new work coming out on cellulose. There might be some preservation issues on those because it's an organic compound in lake sediment. It could uh, be a problem, but it's more widespread than calcite. Calcite is not being formed in every lake, but I'm sure some kind of cellulose and other things are coming in to almost any lake, especially if there's vegetation around it. So. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so the next question is, what is the link between aluminum and ancient human activity? I think aluminum is a proxy for clays. And that's why that, um, that the, the color difference in that clay is because of the presence of aluminosilicate minerals, clay minerals like kaolinite. But when you, th the funny thing about this record, the sensitive nature of this like human impact on the lake is remember we looked at the natural proxies and I showed you the gray bar and there was really no change in there, like nothing distinct. It was like, you know, there's a couple little wiggles, but there was a big change early and it shifted. The human impact during Cahokia didn't really have a big impact on the lake. It was only the transfer of heavy metals and the contaminated sewage that was probably coming in the groundwater. And, but the bulk sediment itself, like if you're just feeling it, it just gets a little finer. So there wasn't like a huge change in mineralogy is what I'm trying to say. And the organic matter content stays about the same. The source of organic matter stays about the same because that's C to N ratio. But you see these heavy metals go up and it's super interesting because we know that those are so sensitive in, in modern societies, like adding mercury to the environment. Um, the environment's extremely sensitive to that because otherwise there's really no mercury ever. Same with lead. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the aluminum suggests a change and I think the source of clays, aluminum silicate clays, and that's probably related to building mounds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have one last question, um, and then I think we can wrap up, but somebody was wondering how far away does the lake have to be from the site in order to detect these heavy metal signatures? That's a good question. Another good one. Um, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on how the culture you're studying. Are you studying somebody that, a culture that's very polluting? Are you studying a culture that has smelting technology like the Romans? Or are you studying people like Cahokia that they had probably only worked like Galena and copper ore in the fire with rock hammers, which still would be enough to which Broxton shows to pollute the lake, but that won't transfer as far in the environment as somebody that like the Roman smelters or even modern day smelters. So if you have a very intensive society, you can go a few kilometers away. And the Romans, we can detect pollution from the Romans on a part per trillion basis in the Greenland ice. So that just shows, you know, just how sensitive these records are. But Ice cores are highly sensitive. I mean, we can go to part per trillion. When we were looking today, that we're in the part per million, which, you know, orders of magnitude different. <clears throat> so if you have something like, if you're interested in studying a Native American, probably closer, like one to some, you know, one to five kilometers. Um, but we're finding out, we only have, we have these two records published from the Mississippian sites, Kincaid and Cahokia. They're the only two that exist. Um, and a brand, this is like a brand new thing for a United States using this technique, but we have other ones underway and we are getting good results. So my feeling is, and this is a lot of researchers working on this. I don't want to speak for everyone because it's not my thing going on right now. My feeling is it's going to be a regional signal. And um, that we're going to find it throughout the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley where the Mississippians were most concentrated. Um, this is consistent surprisingly with what's found in the Maya lowland. So anyone that studies lake sediments in the Maya lowland, they find these things called the Maya clay in lakes that are next to Maya settlements. Very similar to the clay layer we see here at Cahokia. And in the Maya lowland, they always interpreted those as deforestation and changing the catchment for building settlements. And it weathers out the clays from the soil because there's no vegetation holding it in, forms these my clay. But the interesting thing is it's found across the region, suggesting you know the Maya had a big land use impact. What I think we're gonna start to find out is the Mississippians maybe had one like that going on 
in the lower Ohio Mississippi River. And if I was going to speculate, my crazy speculation is that I would say like that whole landscape was anthropogenic like a thousand years ago. I mean, it, the plants and animals, the geochemistry is being altered by humans on a huge scale. And we use geochemistry, we can actually measure that a little bit clear, more clearly than we could with other proxies and kind of map those changes a little bit better. So let's hope for more research. Um, and if, if somebody's interested in this kind of research, especially listening to this, check out Broxton Bird at IUPUI. Um, he's the guy that had the other paper. I know he takes grad students. I don't know with the coronavirus what's going on there now, but um, I currently can't have grad students. So anyone that's interested in that kind of stuff, it's ongoing research right now. It's a new window into the past in North America. So feel free to reach out to him or me if you're interested in getting involved. So thank you. Okay, we did have one more question come in while you're answering, okay. that, if you're up for it. <laughs> if, uh, so if the lake is northwest of the site and winds predominated from the northwest, would that affect the transportation of charcoal and also metals? <clears throat> um, yeah, um, it depends on how it's exactly getting into the lake. Um, my feeling is the metals are airborne, but things like nitrogen isotopes are in the groundwater. So a groundwater signal may not be affected at all by wind direction. Um, charcoal would be certainly, um, especially fossil charcoal. It's hard to know, you know, how that all works in the past with different, slightly different climates, but it certainly would affect it. Um, to what scale, I don't know exactly. So with airborne transport at least. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. Um, Leila, I think you wanted to announce the next, our last <laughs> explorations of the semester. Yeah, so thank you for, thank you so much for being with us, David. That was fantastic. As, as, I, as I said before you started, I always love, I always love a little bit of geology and with the archeology span always makes me really happy. <laughs> nice. uh, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you to all of you for being with us this evening. Um, this is our second to last explorations in archeology span for the semester. Um, our last one will be on December 9th, um, and Dr. Justin Williams will be talking to us about the perils of measuring Clovis. Um, so December 9th, also Wednesday, also at 6 p.m. Uh, Central, and we will hopefully see you all then. Um, you can follow hashtag explorations and archaeology on Twitter um, or on Facebook, although Facebook's kind of odd for hashtags. Um, and that's a good way to make sure that you see our flyers and, um, and get information on our upcoming talks. Um, and then also, just as a final thing, we are starting to put our spring semester for explorations and archaeology together. So if you are somebody who does the kind of work that we enjoy hearing about and talking about explorations, please send either Beth or myself an email. Um, you can find us on social media also and, and let us know. We would love to have you or at least love to see if we can fit everybody into the, into the spring semester. So thank you all so much for being with us and thank you again, David, it's phenomenal. Thank you for and having we me. Will, we will see you all on Wednesday, December 9th. See you everyone.